This week in virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This week in virology, episode number 350, recorded on August 7th, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. I have a special episode for you today. This is an interview I recorded last year with Catherine High, who is professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. This interview is one of 26 different interviews that I did last year for the new edition of our textbook, Principles of Virology. We had decided when we were preparing the next edition of this textbook to include in each chapter an interview with a virologist who made important contributions to the subject of the chapter. So we have 26 different chapters and 26 interviews with people not only like Catherine High, who you'll be hearing today, David Baltimore, Phil Sharp, Carla Kierkegaard, Carolyn Coyne, many, many others. And we wanted to release uh, this particular interview as sort of a teaser to get you interested in the rest of them. The book's going to be published the week of August 24th. And if you buy the book, you'll be able to have access uh, to those interviews. I had a lot of fun doing them. I got to meet a lot of people that I hadn't met before. And of course, I met a lot of people who I knew and talk with them about where they were born and educated, how they got interested in careers in science, and the main experiments that they think were keys to their careers. So let's listen to Catherine High, who is in the chapter uh, early in the book, which deals with viral vectors. And she'll tell us about some of her work using virus vectors to deal with certain uh, human genetic diseases. I'm speaking with Professor Catherine High from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks. Our chat today is part of a chapter called Genomes and Genetics, and part of that chapter is about viral vectors used for gene therapy. And I'd like to start our, our discussion by asking you to tell us where you were born and raised and educated. So I was born in High Point, North Carolina, and I was uh, raised in Greensboro, North Carolina. As an undergraduate, I majored in chemistry at Harvard. My grandfather was also a chemist. And after I finished college, I was really uncertain about what to do. And I worked for a year in a research lab at the Mass General and then decided to go to medical school. And I returned to North Carolina to uh, go to medical school at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. I did not like medical school. <laughs> and after two and a half years, I left to return to work full time in a research lab in chemistry where I worked on a a problem in polymer chemistry that was very interesting to me. But at the end of that time, I decided to return to medical school, and and I actually enjoyed it by then, and uh, and then pursued training in internal medicine and hematology. So, why did you get interested in science? Was it your your father being a chemist? Do you think? Uh, my, it was my grandfather, grandfather. who was a chemist. Uh, I, I think uh, I, yes. From a young age, I was really interested in the chemistry lab, and I found working in laboratories very rewarding in, in ways that it's hard for me to explain or even to understand, but I just, I just felt peace working on a lab bench, and it was endlessly interesting. Mm. I understand that perfectly well. Okay, good. It's perfect. <laughs> Why medicine then? In, in fact, you're, I would say you are a clinical scientist now, mm, correct? Right, uh, that's how right. Did you, how did you take that direction? 
Well, I was uncertain when I graduated from college whether to go more toward medicine or more toward science. My family really encouraged me to move in the direction of science. They did not feel that I would be a good physician. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in my early experiences in medical school, I, I felt confirmed to that. And, uh, and it was why I left medical school for a time, to go mm -hmm. back into the research lab. Uh, but then what I eventually uh, discovered was that I would be able to pursue a primarily lab-based career even with a medical degree and so mm -hmm. that's that's what I've done but as our work evolved and it became clear that we could do efficient gene transfer in small animals and large animals I became interested in trying to move that into mm -hmm. clinical trials and uh, so then it, it turned out to be a good thing that I had training in medicine. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. So how did you get interested in using viruses for gene therapy? Well, I would say that uh, one of the first projects that I took up as a new faculty member after completing my training in hematology uh, was to try to isolate and characterize the gene expressing dog factor nine, and the reason for that was that there was a colony of hemophilic dogs at UNC Chapel Hill where I was working then, and the cloning of the human gene for factor nine had uh, just occurred in 1982, so I decided I would use that to do a low stringency screen of a library and isolate the gene for canine factor nine, and that then we would be able to uh, perhaps work out a method of treating hemophilia with mm -hmm. a gene. Uh, and we could work it out in this large animal model of the disease if I could isolate the normal gene. So uh, that was really how I got interested in the problem. And so then, once the gene was isolated, we, we had to think about how we would transfer it in. Uh, and, of course, there are both non-viral and viral-derived vectors. And I was really agnostic when I began about which of those to use, but it turns out that at this point, anyway, the viral derived vectors are much more efficient mm -hmm. than non-viral gene delivery means. And so, since I wanted to succeed, I pursued work with uh, viral vectors. And we actually tried nearly all of them, mm -hmm. and we were not able to get sustained expression at levels high enough to have a therapeutic effect until we started working with adeno-associated viral vectors. And with AAV, we showed first in 1997 in a mouse model of hemophilia that we could get long-term expression at therapeutic levels. And then eventually we were able to move that into the dog mm -hmm. model. Okay. So can you look back and, and pinpoint what you would say is a key experiment that you did that made it clear that it would work? Well, to me, uh, one of the most exciting experiments that we did uh, was the work that we published in 1997 showing that we could get long-term expression mm -hmm. of clotting factor nine in a mouse model and that it, it could be sustained. So that really uh, moved the mouse from a mouse with severe hemophilia to a pretty much normal mouse. Mm -hmm. and. Since we had been working on that, we cloned the gene for canine factor nine in 1989, and we got that long-term expression at therapeutic levels in a mouse in 1997. Um, so that was a result that we worked for for a long time. Mm. And uh, so I think to me that was really a key mm. driver of much of the rest of the work because it, it, uh, it, it showed that it could be done in a, in a living organism. Mm -hmm. And so then it was worth it to try to scale it up first to dogs and then to people. And that was done using AAV vectors, That was correct? done using AAV vectors. So what is good about using AAV? What are some of the advantages? Well, you know, I think that I, I, I have tried, you know, I used nearly every viral vector right. there was before we got to AAV. And I think that the fact that recombinant AAV vectors are some of the simplest of all mm -hmm. viral vectors. They're fully deleted of viral coding sequences. So really, there's nothing there except a highly ordered set of proteins, which are the viral capsid, and the DNA that mm -hmm. you're trying to transfer in. 
And so in that sense, I think they're the simplest. Mm. Uh, that they are certainly one of the simplest of all the recombinant viral vectors. Um, and a good deal of work had gone into developing methods for large-scale manufacture. So when we, when we moved from a mouse to a dog, so that, you know, a mouse is typically 25 grams and a dog is typically 20 kilograms. So that was really a very large scale up. You know, to go from a dog that's 20 kilograms to a human who's 70 kilograms, it's not really nearly as big scale up as mm. going from a mouse to a dog. But the, you know, so the availability of methods to generate enough recombinant viral vector to move into a large animal like a dog was, you know, was an important mm -hmm. advance that was required for the work that we did. So when you administer vec these vectors to animals, are they injected intravenously typically? Well, in our first work in m mice, we were actually injecting the vector intramuscularly. Mm -hmm. And that works pretty well in an organism as small as a mouse. Uh, you can do that in a dog. It requires a lot of injections. Mm -hmm. And we eventually moved from using muscle as a target tissue to liver as a target tissue. And then you do do intravascular delivery. In our first studies in dogs, we actually infused the vector into the portal vein mm -hmm. uh, or the hepatic artery. And in the first trials in humans, we also use the hepatic artery. Now we use intravenous delivery. So when you deliver a vector intravenously, one of the first places it goes to the liver. And that's why the vector is expressed highly there? So uh, we, we have several features to try to make expression mm -hmm. liver specific. We have a liver specific promoter. Okay. So even to the extent that it, uh, that it transduces other tissues, it typically won't express there. But interestingly, for the vectors that we use, uh, when they're infused intravenously, if you look six weeks later in a biodistribution experiment mm -hmm. in a large animal, most of the vector is actually in the liver. There's some in the spleen, but overwhelmingly mm -hmm. okay. it's uh, transducing the liver and then in addition has a liver specific promoter. And so for, for correcting something like hemophilia, a long-term expression is desirable, right? How long do these vectors persist? Well, uh, in a study that we collaborated on uh, that was uh, initiated at University College London, the first subject was infused in March of 2010 Mm -hmm. And he has now shown expression for more than four years. So um, in dogs, we have seen expression for longer than 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we can get very long-lasting expression. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was one of the challenges when the first liver trial was done. We had preclinical data in the hemophilic dog model showing very long-lasting expression but when we first infused a human subject through the, hum the hepatic artery, mm -hmm. the levels of expression were great. They were enough to change a person's disease from severe to mild hemophilia, but they only lasted for about 12 weeks. And so the important issue that was worked out in the second trial was a method for damping down the human immune response to the recombinant vector so that you could get long-lasting expression. Okay. So is it correct to say, as of this recording, which is in October 2014, no vector is yet approved in the U.S. for therapy? That's correct. There are no approved uh, gene therapy products in the United States right now. So do you have any sense of how much longer it would be until one is approved? Well, uh, there is an approved gene therapy product in Europe, mm -hmm. and the regulatory requirements between the European Medicines Agency and the Federal Food and Drug Administration are similar. Uh, the European agencies do have a special category which is called approval under exceptional circumstances that we don't have here in the United States. And the one approved gene therapy product in Europe was approved under exceptional circumstances. Mm. Um, but uh, we, we know that uh, the first application for the approval of a gene therapy product has gone in to the FDA. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's reasonable to expect that within the next year or two, 
we will see an improved gene oh. therapy product in the United States. So once that first one is approved, then do you think others will follow more rapidly than it's taken to get to this point? Well, I do think that there's a great deal of work that goes into uh, developing the, uh, the assays that mm -hmm. are required to characterize a gene therapy product. And once there's an approved product, there's a roadmap mm -hmm. for uh, the assays that have to be done to demonstrate the uh, the safety, identity, potency, stabili stability, and other critical quality attributes of the recombinant uh, viral vector product. Right. And so I, I think, you know, if you look at the history of other novel classes of therapeutics like monoclonal antibodies, for example, you know, you had one product approved uh, in, I, th I think it was in 1986, OKT3. And then the next monoclonal antibody that was approved was not for another four years. Mm -hmm. And then two years later, there were two or three more. And then, so, you know, the, the beginning can be slow. Yeah. But I think yeah. once the first one is approved, you know, once one group of investigators do it, you'll see others follow suit. Because there are many uh, diseases which involve a single gene, right, that would be suitable for viral gene therapy. Right, right. Of course, the great hope of the Human Genome Project had been that once mm -hmm. all of these genes were delineated, that many therapeutics would follow mm -hmm. in their wake. And, of course, it's taken a good deal longer to work out the details of uh, vector-mediated gene delivery than people had hoped. But I think, uh, you know, I think there will be other applications to the FDA that follow within the next 12 months. And, and that is almost certainly some of those will right. end up as approved products. Can you give us a sense, so you mentioned earlier your key experiment, give us a sense for where your lab went after that. Well, so we, we worked out uh, delivery techniques in mice mm -hmm. uh, for factor IX, both to the liver uh, and to skeletal muscle, mm -hmm. and we showed that we could scale those up into the hemophilic dog model uh, and then we began to do the work that we needed to do to move into clinical trials. And uh, we weighed carefully at the outset whether we should try to deliver the vector to skeletal muscle in men with hemophilia or to the liver. And there had never been trials of AAV in either skeletal muscle or liver, so we didn't have anything mm. to guide us. And we eventually decided that it was probably safer to put material into skeletal muscle uh, than into the liver. And, and some of the factors we considered were that, for example, if you put all of the vector into one of the four bellies of the quadriceps, the vastus lateralis, and you decide later that something terrible is happening and you have to remove the vastus lateralis, you can actually do that and still have a stable mm -hmm. knee and a functional quadriceps. But obviously, once you put something into the liver, you can't really take it back out. Uh, so we started by doing trials in skeletal muscle. And what we saw in those trials was that you could go back into a muscle biopsy and see factor IX being expressed. But we never got levels that were high enough to improve the phenotype of the disease. We mm -hmm. couldn't get circulating levels high enough to, uh, to convert the severe mm -hmm. hemophilia to a milder form of the disease. But the safety data were all good. And so we decided, well, that we would go and deliver. And the, again, you know, we had to uh, satisfy a number of regulatory requirements to do this first trial in the liver. And as I mentioned earlier, the problem was that we got uh, therapeutic levels of expression, but they were only short term, about 12 weeks. The patient felt that he had touched the rainbow because for 12 weeks he did not need to use clotting factor to manage his disease. And it is really amazing to me in the work that I've done, you know, how, how gratified patients are not to be dependent on clotting factor concentrates. You know, as a hematologist, I have to say, we think the concentrates is really a great advance in therapeutics. And they mean that they, they've meant that, that boys with hemophilia can attend school regularly, and can do nearly anything they'd like to grow up to do. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I suppose if you're a patient and, and it means doing a, 
uh, a protein infusion two or three times a week. It's mm. maybe not quite as sure. <laughs> quite as uh, liberating as taking a single injection and then not having to worry about the risk of being away from your refrigerator where you have your clotting factor mm -hmm. concentrator being mm -hmm. being subjected to uh, trauma or something like that, that that would require immediate infusion and so forth. So, um, uh, so after that study, there there were a number of years passed before the next study as we uh, as we attempted to figure out why we had seen a different response in humans compared to what we'd seen in mice, rats, rabbits, hemophilic dogs, and non-human primates, who all showed long-term expression after infusion of the vector. So there were a lot of competing hypotheses about what it might have been, what what mm. might have occurred to give short-term expression in that patient. We felt that the most likely, that the weight of the evidence suggested that it was a memory T cell response mm. to the viral capsid, uh, because most of us have developed immunity to the wild type virus from which recombinant vectors are engineered. Interestingly, we never saw this during the muscle trial. Mm -hmm. In fact, those patients, some of them were biopsied as long as 10 years after the injection, and you could still see the vector mm -hmm. there being expressed. But we went into the liver, uh, we, uh, you know, you can see that the patients developed this expansion of a population of capsid-specific T cells mm -hmm. uh, that then that then destroy the transduced cells in the liver. So about several weeks in, the patients uh, exhibit a rise in liver enzymes and a drop in the factor IX level, and the T cells uh, complete their job. Mm -hmm. They get rid of every hepatocyte that's harboring any uh, capsid-derived peptides, mm -hmm. and everything goes back to normal, but the donated gene has been lost. Right. And so the, it, it actually, you know, it, it took me 60 seconds to say that. It took us years of work in the laboratory that, yeah. to develop the support for the hypothesis. But in the second trial then, the concept was that if the patients showed an increase in liver enzymes or a drop in the factor IX level, that they would immediately um, initiate a course of high-dose steroids mm -hmm. to try to lice those T cells and keep them, fr prevent them from destroying the transduced hepatocytes. And then once the capsid-derived peptides have been degraded and cleared, uh, the steroids can be tapered and the patient will show long-term expression. And that is, in fact, what's happened in hmm. the trial that was, that was begun in London. Hmm. That's simple. You don't have to modify the vector in any way to deal with that. No, That's good. no. <laughs> And, and of course, if you give a low enough dose of vector, you don't even initiate the response. Right. So, so if you're if this treatment for uh, hemophilia is approved one day, um, are you going to continue to tweak it, or are you going to move to some other gene? Well, actually, what we've uh, so so until very recently, I directed a center at Children's Hospital, the Center for Cellular and Molecular Therapeutics, and the goal of our center was really to develop gene-based therapeutics for. Mm -hmm for many diseases that affect children. So in addition to working on hemophilia, the other work we've done has been in a form of congenital blindness called Labor's congenital amaurosis type two. It's a very rare disorder, but again, there was a large animal model of it. There was a naturally occurring dog model of the same type of blindness, and our collaborator at Penn, Jean Bennett, had been able to show that she could do a subretinal injection of an AAV vector mm -hmm. uh, and restore vision in dogs born with this disease if she was able to treat them before the age of about one year. Hmm. So beginning in 2007, we initiated a clinical trial of a subretinal injection of an AAV vector into children and young adults with the same disorder and were able to show that uh, you, you do have recovery of vision in individuals um, following vector injection. We've mm -hmm. been able to show using a number of different assays for visual and retinal function, pupillary light reflex, mm -hmm. visual acuity, visual fields, and a mobility assay that we developed to run in the ophthalmology clinic where there's a pattern set down on the floor 
of black arrows on white background, and the patient is supposed to follow the arrows and avoid obstacles mm. and duck under things and round things and so forth. And we've been able to show that injection of the vector will restore the patient's ability to traverse the mobility assay accurately, even at reduced levels of lighting. Uh, and so that product is actually in phase three testing, and we hope will be one of those nice. applications that goes into the FDA soon. You mentioned the hemophiliacs were happy to get off their, uh, their infusions. How, how is it when, they, when patients are able to see again? That must be amazing. Well, that, that really has been extraordinary. The, in the phase one, two study, there were five children and seven young adults, and the, and the five children were all able to go from Braille classrooms to sighted classrooms after having just one eye injected. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really been extraordinary to see children who entered the hospital using a white cane and who subsequently were able to join the Little League team or, Amazing. you know, just operate much more independently mm. than they had before. It's been, it's been very exciting and gratifying. So in all the years you've been working in science, have you, have you seen technology change in ways that have benefited your work? Well, I, I think to me it's been very exciting to be involved with, uh, with trying to establish a basis for taking some of the data from the Human Genome Project and actually using it to develop therapeutics. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I've spent obviously many years trying to do this sort of work mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I think it would be very exciting to see us actually be able to treat genetic diseases that have heretofore been untreatable or uh, have been treated only by a continuously administered treatment like mm -hmm. we do now for hemophilia to reach the point where we could actually um, get a long-term therapy from a single injection. Yep. So of all the things that you've done in science, which do you think has made the greatest contribution to the field? Well, you know, I think all scientists always believe that the things that they've done that, that will be most long-lasting are training other mm -hmm. young scientists. And, you know, I think I, I'm like everybody else. I feel that the, the most important thing I've done is train people who, who have gone out and done exciting things on their own. Um, it's a great answer. <laughs> Not everyone has said that. Oh, really? Yes. Well, I guess I'm surprised about that. But. I've, I've hoped that everyone would say it, but not everyone has, which is fine. Um, <clears throat> if you hadn't been a clinician scientist, what would you have done in your lifetime? Well, I think I'm about to find out. So <laughs> I, I mentioned that um, until actually about a month ago, um, I was an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the director of the center at Children's Hospital that's devoted uh, to, to uh, developing new gene and cell-based therapeutics for genetic diseases. And as of one month ago, I transitioned to the company that has been spun out of our unit mm. uh, as the chief scientific officer. So we are attempting to move these products that were developed in our center uh, through the regulatory pathway to mm -hmm. become licensed products, licensed and commercialized products. And uh, so I have moved from uh, the professoriate mm. to uh, the world of business. But, uh, you know, as you, as I'm sure uh, the readers of the principles of virology know, uh, to, to actually develop uh, drugs as therapeutics costs a great deal of money and the sums of money required cannot easily be uh, generated from NIH grants and that means access to mm. uh, larger capital markets than we can get at the university yeah. and uh, so thus my <laughs> mm. that, thus my move to a company that is really going to be focused on trying to develop these products. Is it something you ever thought you would do in your career? Well, you know, it's really interesting. My, my grandfather, the chemist, ran a research group at, Lockheed, at what is now Lockheed Martin, and he counseled me to remain uh, on a faculty because he felt that it would be difficult for me to thrive in the business world. 
he considered that it was not very friendly to women. Hmm. So uh, it's many years later now, and I suppose I'll find out <laughs> whether things are different, but uh, I'm, I'm flying in the face of his advice and, uh, and working to, uh, at work that I think is very important to try to develop gene therapy as a product. What do you do when you have a, a, a need for a therapeutic, but the market isn't big enough? A good example would be Ebola therapeutics, right. which never went forward because there was no one to pay for them. Right, right. You know, um, those are two different questions, I mm -hmm. would say. Rare diseases mm -hmm. actually do provide a pathway for profitability in the current pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. So there are actually a number of products that are marketed uh, for for very rare diseases, and mm -hmm. they tend mm -hmm. to be expensive, but, uh, but that's um, supported right now in the United States and Europe. The question you're asking is, what about rare diseases that are found in places where people can't pay for the therapy? Right. And you know that that's really a different question, and I'm afraid I don't have a very good answer for that. So, um, th as you mentioned earlier, we have uh, readers of this textbook who, many of whom, may want to be virologists or do clinical research. Let's say, w what kind of advice would you have for them? Well, I think that um, that the world really needs people who are interested in what I call translational research. Mm -hmm. And I would say that one can prepare for that in a variety of different ways. I attended medical school, but I would say that some of the best translational investigators that I've trained uh, w received their PhDs in, uh, in fields like microbiology. I would say one of the very best translational investigator, uh, investigators that I trained, Roland Herzog, who's at the University of Florida, received, uh, did, did his graduate work in filamentous fungi, mm -hmm. uh, but, mm -hmm. but he really exhibited, once he got to our lab as a postdoc, an extraordinary uh, ability to soak up like a sponge all the other uh, areas of science that he needed, anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, to become really a, a talented uh, translational investigator. So I think people uh, can prepare in a lot of different ways. And what's really required is that, that people be interested in therapeutics and then be, and then be able to uh, put themselves into an environment where they can address whatever deficiencies there are in their background. I mean, it's mm. very hard to learn everything you need to be a translational investigator in one uh, area of training. It really doesn't matter what that first area is. You're going to have to complement it with other uh, types of learning. I mean, one of the first uh, problems that we ran into in the liver trial was that uh, not predicted by studies in animals, humans showed vector DNA in semen samples. So the biodistribution of the material was different in humans compared to, uh, compared to animals. And the regulatory agencies were very concerned because of the risk of germline transmission. Mm -hmm. And so we had to drop back and develop animal models of biodistribution and, and so forth that, I mean, honestly, I was not remotely interested in the male reproductive tract when I was in medical school. And, you know, all of a sudden you <laughs> had to learn all kinds of details about it. And, uh, you know, that, that's translational research. Um, so, you know, it, it requires people with a wide-ranging set of interests, but, uh, and I think one of the things I've really learned is that, that you do have to solve the problems that you encounter. You can't look at them and say, well, I don't know anything about that, or I'm not interested in it. Hmm. I mean, so, so you have to identify people who are willing to take what comes right. and work on it. So were mentors important in your development as a scientist? Well, of course, I think that's always uh, the case. Uh, I, I did my hematology training in the laboratory of Ed Benz, and I, I think, you know, he's he's somebody who um, certainly taught me the importance of solving the problems that arise, not 
not deciding that they weren't interesting to mm -hmm. me. And then I had terrific uh, mentors in the area of molecular and cellular biology of coagulation when I was a new faculty member. And if it had not been for those people, I don't think I would have evolved into an independent faculty mm. member. So, do you, have, do you have any suggestions or advice about how to find good mentors? How to identify them? Well, for me, I always tried to, when I decided to go into a lab, I tried to interview people who were in the lab mm. to assess their experience and look at the productivity of the mentor and in particular, the productivity of the trainees in the laboratory um, as the best indicator. And I think, you know, you would think that that would be an obvious thing mm. that uh, graduate students or uh, postdoctoral fellows would look for, but it's always surprising to me that they don't always do that. Right, right. I've been speaking with Professor Catherine Hive from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. And good luck with your new job. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> this episode of TWIV, just like all the others, can be found at iTunes or at twiv.tv. You can also find the video for this interview uh, at twiv.tv. And if you have any questions or comments about this or any other TWIV, you can send them to twiv at twiv.tv. I've already thanked Dr. Catherine High for participating in this interview with me today. I would like to thank the American Society for Microbiology, ASM Press, and in particular Christine Charlip, who is the director of ASM Press, for allowing us to publish another edition of Principles of Virology, and for accepting this idea to interview 26 different uh, contributors to the field. Uh, I had to travel around and incur expenses, and I really appreciate that she was willing to do that. I think they are a great resource, and I really do think that they are worth a big part of the price of the book, uh, because where else can you hear some of these individuals talking for anywhere between a half hour or an hour about what got them interested in science? So uh, I, I really appreciate that. I think our, our readers will love it as well. I also want to thank Chris Kandayan and Ray Ortega, our stalwarts over at ASM, who are our video producers and helped participate not only in the filming of these interviews, but in the editing and production as well. So thanks all around to the great team at the American Society for Microbiology. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You can also find me on Twitter, P-R-O-F-V-R-R. -R. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.